All right, welcome everybody. Happy Valentine's Day and welcome to your Ron Brooks show. I hope everybody's having a fantastic Sunday. I am uh, still on the road. Not a great place to be on Valentine's Day. Should be home. Um, I find myself, unfortunately, often on the road on uh, Valentine's Day. For the last few years, I've typically, during Valentine's Day, I've been in, um, in Europe. Uh, February seems to be a great day for uh, a great time for, for me to be in Europe when it's cold and freezing and depressing. But uh, that has been the case. I do, however, the reason my wife forgives me for uh, missing Valentine's Day is our wedding anniversary is, um, is very close to Valentine's Day, just a few days afterwards. And I make it back home by our wedding anniversary. So that'll be the case this trip. I'll be back home in time. Um, and uh, therefore, I'm uh, given a uh, free pass on uh, on missing uh, Valentine's Day. Um, Stephanie says, I hope you bring your wife a really lovely present. <laughs> I have to admit, I, I'm not good at presents. Never have been, um, never will be. Uh, presence isn't what binds us together. So <laughs> my wife has very low expectations when it comes to presence. So uh, we, we've, we've made it work. We've made it work without the gifts. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is the thing about jewelry, right? And this is, uh, you learn, um, it's much easier and much more beneficial and uh, much more beneficial if uh, if she goes and buys the jewelry herself. So uh, I have terrible taste. I don't know anything about this. I you know, and I basically told my wife when uh, when uh, we first got married, don't expect me to buy jewelry. If you want to buy jewelry, I'll provide I'll provide the money, uh, but uh, but not the selection. All right. So I hope all of you uh, have an opportunity to celebrate Valentine's Day today with a loved one, with a romantic partner. Uh, I, you know, I, it's, I, the show is early enough so that uh, hopefully you still have plans later on this evening uh, to, uh, to, uh, to celebrate. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think that every once in a while it's important that we do a show that is... Um, that is focused on kind of positive values that gets us away from politics and gets us out. So I was debating a number of political topics I could have talked about today. I haven't talked about the impeachment. It, you know, it was, there's still some stuff I want to talk about with regard to free speech. There's a lot of things to talk about. But then it dawned on me, wait a minute, enough. Uh, Valentine's Day is a good day to talk about love. Uh, and it, Maybe talk about love in a broader context, because we did do a show recently uh, comparing Ayn Rand's view of love with Jordan Peterson. So we did talk quite a bit. Uh, we did talk quite a bit about uh, the importance of romantic love. I want to emphasize that today, and I will. But then I want to talk more broadly about love. I, I often talk about objectivism as the philosophy of love. Uh, and I want to I want to talk about that a little bit and really uh, view this show today as more of a motivation show, more of a show to get you excited about pursuing your values and, and about pursuing objectivism. Not as, not as a philosophy to understand politics, not as a philosophy to understand what's going on in the world, but a philosophy to live by, a philosophy to guide your life as an individual towards your values uh, and, and your success in life as an, and as a human being. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. Uh, I, I've accepted the fact that as a consequence, we'll have a lot fewer viewers. If I'd uh, made the show about, uh, about the far right, which was, I was going to do, uh, and, uh, and what's going on in the right or the future of the right, we would have got a lot of viewers. So we'll We'll hold that off uh, for a future show. That's not going anywhere. That's not going anywhere. So um, we talked about this uh, a, a few um, a few weeks ago. But look, I, I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, angst in the world right now. There's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of fear. 
there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's uncertainty, uh, economic uncertainty. There's there's massive political uncertainty. There's real, you know, concern about about the future and about freedom and about where this country's heading, where the world is heading, and uh, and what any of us can really do about it, which is unfortunately very little. Uh, there is a certain direction that this world is heading towards, and you and I have, unfortunately, very little control on that direction. We, we've got to fight, and we've talked about that. We've got to keep fighting, and I will talk about that. But essentially, much of what is going on in the world is outside of our control. What is, though, in your control is your life. What is in your control are your values. Now, it, it is true, and I'll say that right up front, that politics affects our values and, and uh, the state of the world, the economic state of the world, the political state of the world is going to affect the scope and the range of the values possible to us. Remember values? Values are thing one acts to gain or keep. In a rational context, values are the things necessary for your survival as an individual, for your thriving as an individual, for your success, for your flourishing, for life. So the scope of those values, the extent of those values are limited by the context in which we live. And, and again, there's better or worse, for, 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 for worse, there's little, there's little we can do about that. Much of that is going to be dictated and much of that is going to be determined by people who have very different ideas and very different philosophy than we do. But there is a vast scope of values still accessible to us. Among them is romantic love. And, and I think romantic love is a crucial value. It's one that deserves that you engage in real effort real focus, real attention to achieve if you have not achieved yet. The value is things one acts to gain or keep, so act to gain it. Don't be passive. Don't be a coward. Go out and get, go out and, and try, go out and make a real effort to gain one of the most important values uh, that is possible for you. <laughs> Faith asks, are you not feeling well? Your energetic self ain't there. Um, it, this is what happens to me in hotels. <laughs> it kind of what happens to me when I'm sitting down and doing the show sitting down. <laughs> it's, um, uh, that's why some people would like me to, to do the show seated because I'm much more calm, much more relaxed, a little bit less energy, but no, I am feeling great. So, uh, it has nothing to do with how I feel. It has more to do with kind of, it just, everything slows down when you sit down. And, uh, and, and being in a hotel and, and being in a foreign setting, it just, it just changes. I think my energy is going to ramp up as we get a little bit uh, focused. I, I look a little disheveled. Uh, yeah, well, you know, traveling, traveling. Um, so if you don't yet have a romantic partner, partner, and, I, you know, and it seems strange to even have to say this, but with the popularity of, I don't know, uh, men going their own way and, and incels, and uh, this seems to be particularly a male problem, of men uh, wanting to live without, uh, without women or, or, or without long-term relationships, just bizarre. It seems necessary to say, don't give up on one of the great joys of life. Don't give up on what I think is an essential, crucial, maybe not necessary, but crucial value to attaining happiness. Go out and make an effort and try and, and, and engage and, and love. Find someone who shares your values. Find somebody who reflects your values back to you. Find somebody who you can admire and love and cherish and, and spend time with. Don't find a nurse. Is, 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 uh, <laughs> not that anything bad with nurses, but, but uh, you know, the kind of the Jordan Peterson idea of you've got to find somebody who will help you when times are bad. No, find somebody who will celebrate life with you every single day. Find somebody who you will 
love to spend the good times with and who will be there for you when times are rough. And if, um, if you already have that relationship, then cherish it, keep it, <laughs> work to keep it. Like all values, it, it doesn't just, it's not just there. It requires effort. It requires attention. It requires focus. It requires thinking, thinking like everything else in life. Right? <laughs> it requires actual engagement, just like everything in life. You can't just go by emotion, by feeling, by you've got to actually think it through. You've got to actually figure out how to stay engaged, keep your relationship healthy and positive and moving forward. So it, it, it's hard to, un, to, it's hard to overestimate. It's hard to uh, say um, too much about the value and importance of romantic love in a healthy life, in a uh, happy life, in a successful life, in a long life. So don't give up on it. And again, I know that it's hard. I know that it's hard to find somebody who shares your values. I know that it's hard to find in the world with, with a philosophy so different than yours and ours. It's so hard to find somebody who really you can love, but you, you, you know, there's no option but to try and fight and search and keep trying. And the world is vast enough that there's a good chance you will find somebody. They don't have to be an objectivist. They don't have to agree with you on everything. But they have to reflect some fundamental, important values, your sense of life, something. They have to reflect back where you are. Right? Not being alone. And that's true of love, but it's also true of friendship. I know too many objectivists who think that a friendship is in chat groups and in, um, uh, in Facebook, that friendship is Facebook. Uh, friends are incredibly valuable. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, today is a day to remember to love, to befriend, to pursue your values. But I think in a broader sense, the philosophy that, you know, many of us embrace, the philosophy of objectivism, Ayn Rand's ideas, can be presented as a philosophy really. What is the essential thing about love? I mean, how can one love? I mean, uh, I think, I think uh, Ayn Rand uh, uh, somewhere says, um, before you can say, I love you, one has to be able to say, I. So you start with the I. You start by having, by taking you seriously, by taking your life seriously, by loving yourself, by pursuing your values. You start with you. And objectivism gives you the principles by which to live by, to live successfully, to live happily, to gain self-esteem, to gain self-respect, to gain appreciation for who you are. Objectivism encourages you, the virtue of pride, to seek to be the best that you can be to strive towards and try to achieve moral perfection, which means to take your life seriously with everything that that implies, to fight for your values, to strive for your values, for whom? For you, so that you can be the best that you can be, so that you can live the best life that you can live.
It means taking your mind seriously. And it requires, psychologically, it really does require that you love life. I think that is, that is the precondition for loving anything else, is loving being alive, loving life, loving the fact that you open your eyes and you see all this and you can understand it and you can shape it and you can have an impact that you are in control. Imagine if you believed there was no free will. How could love be possible? I am nothing but just random atoms. You know, I, I make no choices. The world is not mine. That would be pretty dark. That would be pretty bleak. That would be pretty depressing. So you are in control. The recognition of that. And this world is amazing. And your, your ability to live in this world is amazing. And the fact that you exist is amazing. And that should inspire you. Every day should inspire you. So we start with the love of being alive, the love of the world that makes it, that, that in which we live. With all the flaws that exist out there, it's still good to be alive. And of course you can, you have control over the kind of life you want to live, the kind of world you want to create. So the fact that you love life, the fact that you love being in this world is the real motivation for going out there and trying to shape it and try to make it better and trying to make it the best that it can be for you. And that's, of course, everything about objectivism encourages you to do that, to produce, to reshape reality. In a sense, in your image, to reshape reality for your own life, for your own enjoyment, for your own values, for your own financial well-being. And knowing that you can do that, again, is part of, part of what it is to, to, to love the world. Imagine if you were, <laughs> imagine if we were born into a world where you had no ability to shape the world around you. You had no ability to reshape it to fit into your values. Robert says, let's see, Robert Nasir says, you are speaking my language. You are the star of your life. Yes. The director. Yes. The screenwriter. Yes. And the producer of this show. And don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Now, the beauty of it is that everybody else is the same in their life. At least everybody else who's healthy is the same as their life. And that your interaction with them is between producers, between directors, between screenwriters. So just as you would not want anybody else to try to impose their life on you, their values on you, their control over you, you should never want to do that to somebody else. Another way in which to live a healthy, productive marriage is to recognize that. That we're all independent we're all producers, directors, screenwriters, and actors. We're all stars. And we all need to be granted the independence and treated as individuals and stars. And we ask, what's the connection between productivity and love? Well, as I said, the, 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 you know, I think love starts with self. And... I don't think you can really love yourself and love your life unless you are productive. Because productivity is essential for your self-esteem. It's essential for you to feel, to know that you can take care of yourself in this world, that you are competent, that you belong, that you can sustain your life in this world. 
So productivity is essential for self-esteem, which I think is essential for loving oneself, which I think then is essential for loving others. That is, if you cannot control your own environment, if you cannot take care of yourself, if you cannot earn a living, if you cannot produce, then you, what emotion would that evoke in you? Imagine, place yourself in that kind of situation. You don't know where the money's going to come from tomorrow, or you're living off of some trust fund, but you can't produce anything. You can't create anything. What that produces is fear, maybe resentment, certainly lack of self-esteem. And that eviscerates any ability to respect yourself, and therefore, and it eviscerates any ability to love someone else. You can potentially like people, you can, you can uh, be dependent on people, you can, um, you can lust after others, but real love, real love the, requires, real romantic love requires that you be, you have an I, you have a self, and that self requires that you produce, that you create. At whatever level you can, in whatever, whatever, you know, we all have different roles in terms of production. So I think productivity and being productive, and generally, I think being virtuous, being rational, being productive, being independent, being honest, are kind of prerequisites for being good. <laughs> at love, at, at, at experiencing it fully, being able to sustain it, being able to maintain it, being able to maintain a relationship. People with low self-esteem have hard times maintaining relationships. They're constantly doubting themselves, never mind doubting others. So uh, objectivism is about loving life. You know, one of the main features of objectivism, one of the main uh, Outcomes of objectivism is a real love of life, a real love of the engagement with reality. And, and again, the link to productivity is one of the things that I think are so essential to be successfully productive is to love what you do. Again, to love is to value. To love is to value strongly. To love is to is to place whatever it is you love as a, as a, as a really at the top of the value hierarchy. And, and we know that productivity as a virtue is, is, a, is, a, is a virtue. Purpose is a cardinal value. But think about people who have, who, who have a, a career, but they hate it. They don't enjoy it. They don't like it. Compare that to somebody who loves their career who loves being productive, who loves going to work every day, who loves what they do in every moment of what they do. That, I mean, think about how much that elevates your life. Think about how much more that enhances your ability to love the world and love your life and love everything that you do. Because we spend so much time at work. We spend so much effort at work. We spend so much of our mental effort at work. One of the real crucial reasons you should find a career that you love, you should not settle with regard to career. It's just the amount of time, energy, effort you spend there. You want to make every moment count. You want to make every every ounce of cal every every <laughs> not ounce of calories. Every calorie you exert in an effort, you want it to count, you want it to matter. Again, I, I say this often, but you can't, there's no repeat, there's no rewind, there's no redo, there's no, I'll get those hours back. This is it. This is it. So make every moment of it count. So love what it is you're being productive at. Find things you love to do. And if, if you can't find a job that you love, then, then find a hobby that you love. Find values that you love. Find something to focus your time on that you really, really, really love, that you enjoy, that you get 
immense pleasure out of. Uh, pleasure is, <laughs> you want pleasure. Pleasure is good. So if you can love yourself and you can love the world in which you live and you love your life, then you start discovering people that you can love. Friends that you can love. Heroes that you can love. Historical figures. Figures in novels. People in your life. With the pinnacle of that being, you know, romantic love. Everything about objectivism is, 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 is this pursuit of great values. And pursuit of great values, why? You know, what are values? Things, things we love. Things that are important to us. Things that are crucial to our lives. So everything about this philosophy is about love. Why, why do we want freedom? Why do we love freedom? I love freedom. So that I can make more of my life, so I can pursue more of my values, so I can more intensely and more, more, you know, express myself and ultimately my love of the world. So freedom is not just some abstraction. And this is where, you know, part of what objectivism, once it's fully integrated, once you've really thought it through, what, it, what, what objectivism really can contribute is this integration of your thoughts and your emotions. If you don't just understand it, yeah, freedom is important, but you feel it. But you feel it. You're passionate about it. You're energized by it. You know, people ask me, this relates to a previous question, I guess. People ask me, where do you get the energy to be on stage or to do four talks a day or to do all, you know, all the, the traveling and all this stuff? And the energy comes from love. It comes from loving what you're doing. It comes from loving the ideas. It comes from loving the world that you're trying to create. It comes from loving every aspect of what you do. Alicia says, I'm ripping off that love of freedom to pursue my values line. Absolutely. I mean, why do we care about freedom? This is a point I made in the talk. I, it's actually on my channel. You can find it that I gave um, to a group of Russian objectivists about, um, about why morality is important. And, it, you know, I started off the talk by why morality is important for the fight for freedom. And I asked, I asked the question right at the beginning, why do we care about freedom? Why is freedom important? Because I, I truly think that if you're an altruist, if you take your altruism seriously, you don't care. You cannot care about freedom. You cannot be passionate about freedom. Freedom's not that important. But if you are an egoist, if you have, if you are pursuing values, if you're pursuing happiness, if you're pursuing your life, then freedom is crucial. Because it gives you the space to pursue your values. It gives you the space that, to, to think about your ideas, your values, your life, and go and act on it without asking for permission, which might be turned, well, you might be turned down. So it's... Um, Freedom is not a, a starting point. This is my big claim against libertarians, right? You don't start with freedom. Freedom is not a floating abstraction. Freedom is not something theoretical you just have out there. Yeah, freedom's good. The, the idea of people choosing and stuff. No, freedom is something you, you need to be passionate about because it's about your life, your values, your love, your ability to pursue your happiness. It's personal. And it's important. And I think the reason people are not excited about freedom, the people, the reason people are not willing to, to fight for freedom, the reason we're, we're not automatically just gravitate towards freedom, the reason freedom is not in everybody's hearts, as George Bush once famously said, 
it's because most people are not that excited about pursuing their own values, their own life, their own happiness. And they've been taught that even if they want to do that, that's not the right thing. That's not the moral thing, the right thing, the moral thing, to pursue other people's values, to, to help other people, to sacrifice for other people. And freedom, freedom is not exciting. And in, indeed, under freedom, I might be tempted not to be moral. Under freedom, I might be tempted to pursue my own self-interest. The nice thing about somebody else telling me what I can and cannot do is that they could guide me to be good. So maybe it's good to be unfree. And, and so for the altruist, freedom is, is difficult. It's not something you can be excited about. And it's not an accident that political freedom is an outcome of the enlightenment, an outcome of, of, of the rediscovery of reason and, and the rediscovery of personal values and the, the, and the idea of individual as an end in himself and the idea of individualism. And it's not an accident <laughs> that the pursuit of happiness is in the Declaration of Independence. They understood it that way. They wanted happiness. They wanted success. They wanted to live a good life. They wanted to do it on their own standards, through their own choices. And freedom was a means to achieving that. It's not an end. The end is your life. The end is your happiness. The end are your values. The end is your ability to love. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is another reason why politics, you have, to, you have to view politics through this lens of, it's just a means. You know, if, if you established complete laissez-faire capitalism tomorrow, you still have to live. You still have to make the right choices. You still have to think. You still have to pick values. You still have to love. You still have to get a date you still have to, you know, find beautiful art to enjoy. You still have to take responsibility for your own life. Laissez-faire capitalism only, it's, not, it's, a, it's a big only, but it's only, creates the context by which you have more choices and you have more ability to live, but it's still up to you to go out and live. So, in a sense, it's... It's not, a, it's, it's not an end. It's a beginning. So if you're going to be obsessed about something, be obsessed about your values. Be obsessed about the things you love. Be obsessed about the things that make you happy. And then fight for freedom because it's interfering in your ability to gain those values. But first have values. First define values. Make those values clear in your mind and go after them to the extent that you can within the world, and then identify where statism is obstructing your ability to access your values, to gain your values, to keep your values, and go after it. Then be passionate about your politics. But to me, it's bizarre that people don't have a life, they don't pursue values, they don't care, they seem pretty miserable, but they fight passionately for political freedom. And then what? Then they'll wake up. What about all the years where they were asleep? Particularly given that they're not going to be successful anytime soon. And this is again the, 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 um, um, the difference between objectivists and libertarians. Libertarians are about politics as an end. Non-aggression principle. That's the end be all. But that's just the beginning. And it's not even the beginning. That's just to improve your ability to be happy, to improve your ability to access values that are difficult to access today. But everything ends and begins with your life, with your happiness, with your values. And, 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 and yeah, under laissez-faire capitalism, 
people would, uh, yeah, Jennifer, absolutely. Freedom to do what? You want freedom so you can do what? Keep more of your tax money? What are you going to do with that money? I mean, you should be able to keep more of your tax money. But, but in the end, you have to do something with it. And what are you going to do? What are you going to pursue? How are you going to live? What, are you gonna, what choices are you going to make? What's your career going to be? Who are you going to love? Those are the important questions in life. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. By the way, um, very much open to um, Super Chat questions. Uh, so uh, use them to ask lots of questions because uh, I don't, let me see, I need to find a way to bold this. Sorry, one second. Expand that. There we go. All right. Um, thanks, Jamie. All right. We'll start with uh, that question. So, yeah, let's start with, um, let's, good. We've got some uh, some questions about this topic, and then we'll take questions on other topics as well. Yuan, can you be more clear on the deriv derivation of pleasure? A close friend of mine is big on pleasure, but it's mostly derived through promiscuity, which I oppose, and he admits doesn't make him fulfilled. Can this kind of pleasure be virtuous? Well, it depends what you mean by promiscuity. If, if the promiscuity is undermining some other value, then no, then you're gaining short-term pleasure by sacrificing some long-term capacity to, to have um, intimacy or to have a real relationship or to have kind of the, 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 the ideal of sex. If you're, if you're pretending that, let's say this promiscuity regards sex, and I assume it does, um, if you're pretending that every woman you sleep with is the love of your life in order to kind of fake the, the, the sex, then it's pretend, you're lying to yourself and you're, you're, you're being dishonest and that undermines your ability ultimately to love and, and to have self-esteem, part of the promiscuity undermines your self-esteem. So you have to be careful about that. But remember at the same time that pleasure is crucial. So you want to do it, you want to have pleasure appropriately, but, and, and, and I'm not just talking about sexual pleasure, I'm talking about pleasure generally. You want to you want to once in a while have a great meal. You want once in a while to just go and, and, and get a good massage and just, just enjoy it. You want, you know, not one of those massages that, it, that where, they, where they're trying to break your bones and, and distort your muscles, but actually just for pleasure, just for the physical sensation that this is nice. Um, and I'm not talking about those massages in those other types. I'm talking just, just, a, just a, sex is complicated, right? You want to, you know, you want to be able to have just, you want to be able to enjoy physical pleasure, right? Um, because it's, it's life affirming, because it's pleasurable, because it feels good. Not as the totality of life, because we know we're mind body integrated, but sometimes the body needs you need and 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 it's it's really good to experience the full the 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 physical pleasure that's involved um so um make sure it doesn't undermine your long-term values make sure what you're doing is not um fakery it's not a you're not deceiving yourself Right, you know, another good example of this is is you know, masturbation is good because it's pleasurable, because it's physical pleasure. So, embrace it. Right. Don't. I mean, we live in a culture in which that is considered, or used to be considered, taboo or unspeakable, or not something you talk about. But why? It's a form of physical pleasure that you can, of intense physical pleasure that you can do to yourself. Why would you not want to feel that, experience that? 
So um, there are lot, many forms in which pleasure can be based. Now, sex, as I said, is complicated. To, to get and to not, I think, do yourself psychologically harm with sex, there has to be some thing that is that connects you and the person you're having sex with. There has to be some shared values. I don't think it has to be the love of your life. Otherwise, you should never have sex with anybody else. I, but there has to be some shared values. There has to be some psychological reflection, uh, reflection back. There has to be some real connection. And you know, and I and I think you you can't have that connection with you know a thousand people. It's relatively rare to have that connection. So it's not like you can go to a bar and pick up anybody. But you know, I'm not against having. Uh, you know, I'm actually not not against. I'm for having sex before you get married. I'm for having sex with with more than one partner as you learn about sex and as you learn about romance and as you learn about pleasure and as you learn about life it, it is it is you know it, it just doesn't make sense that there's only one person you can have sex with in your life it, it, i mean that's just not true it's very intimate it, it exposes you it's very revealing about who you are experience sex. You just want to make sure that when you have sex with somebody, it's with somebody who you are willing to do that with. But on the other hand, and I, you know, I have to say this, and some people won't like this, you know, you can make mistakes there. You know, you can have sex with somebody and discover that it's wrong and it's bad and you feel bad about it, but that's not the end of the world. There are emotional consequences to sex, but okay, but those can overcome just like there's emotional consequences to making mistakes in a lot of different things. So I would rather you err on, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble with somebody in this, some people in this. I would rather you err on, ha you know, err on slightly on the side of have, you know, being promiscuous than being too chaste. Because part of this is learning. Part of this is figuring out. We're not, we don't, like every other thing about human beings, we're not born with the knowledge of what works and what doesn't work for us when it comes to intimacy. Right? Don't view it too lightly, but don't view it like it's the end of the world. Right? So, you know, so again, I think erring on the side of pleasure is better than erring on the side of no pleasure. What did I say was cool? I don't know what I said was cool. Somebody says I said something was cool. And I think this, by the way, goes for women and men. Um, the, the idea that only men um, um, can enjoy sex is absurd. I actually think women enjoy sex more than men. Um, I think uh, I, I think that the whole perception of men as sexual and women as not sexual is bizarre. Um, I think a, a cultural attitude towards promiscuity among men, which is okay, but not among not with women, and I I think we should evaluate men and women the same when it comes to this. They're, they're human. They both have the. I mean, they're both the same fundamentally in terms of being human and being rational beings. So the, the evaluation is the same. If promiscuity is bad, then we should condemn the men as much as the women for being promiscuous. Right? All right. Uh, yeah, but it, 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 I mean, I think what I want to, what I want to emphasize here is Embrace values, embrace life, and pursue it. And, and that includes, by the way, um, it includes, by the way, uh, sex and romance and everything else. Em embrace it. Try seek it in a healthy, productive way. Right. Um, 
just look, looking at some of the comments here. All right. What is your favorite depiction of romantic love in literature or other works of art? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's, it's hard to just bring that off the cuff. Uh, I should have thought of that in advance. Um, there's some beautiful sculptures um, of, uh, of couples. I, I, I'm not a fan of Rodin's The Kiss, but, but it's, it, it's certainly... But there are better ones than Rodin's The Kiss. There's, there's, a one, there's a sculpture from Denmark of a kiss that I think is just beautiful and, and incredibly romantic um, uh, by, uh, I can't remember the, I can't remember the, Sidling, Sinding, Sinding, the sculpture. He's a, he's a um, uh, Danish sculptor. Um, there's, some, there's some really beautiful paintings that I think depict romantic love. Uh, and of course, in painting and sculpture, to capture romantic love, one has to, I mean, you have to be really, really good because you have to capture a certain look, you have to capture a certain pose, you have to capture in very, you have to, you know, love is an abstraction. And, um, and here you have to, you have to capture that abstraction in very concrete terms, which is a real challenge. Um, Cyrano um, is, of course, uh, thank you, Christopher. Cyrano is, is, a, is an amazing depiction of, um, of love. Uh, of course, it's, it's un, unfulfilled love. In that sense, it's sad. So it's unfulfilled love. Um, and, and most songs about unfulfilled love. So, you know, of course, Mr. Sunshine is one of my all-time favorites. Again, the challenge of Mr. Sunshine is, and I've said this before in terms of what I think the big weakness of Mr. Sunshine is, is it's never expressed, the love is never fully expressed physically. And I think, I think Mr. Sunshine would have been a much better show if at least in the episode before last uh, or or at the beginning of the last episode, they had consummated the love. They had had sex. They, had, you know, so it's. I think that the lack of physicality is unfortunate in that show because, in so many other respects, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, in literature, what what else in literature? I mean, of course, Ayn Rand's novels. Um, but outside of Ayn Rand, yeah, literature is not my strong suit. But um, you know, I think I, you know, I've, I haven't read Ivanhoe in a long time. But I remember there's a there's some great love scenes there. There's of course uh, amazing, amazing music that is associated with love in opera, whether it's in Tosca by Puccini. Generally, Puccini is very good at expressing that kind of sense of romantic love in music. So if you, uh, if you, if you think about Tosco, La Boheme, there's some beautiful arias uh, where the lovers sing to each other. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful movie. It's an amazing movie. Uh, uh, Anna Karenina, somebody says, covers a whole gamut as far as love is concerned, but it's such a tragedy. Uh, and it's not essentially romantic. Part of the problem with Anna Karenina and, and Tolstoy generally is it's naturalism and it's, 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 you know, romance is necessarily tragic because of its romanticism. Um, yeah, I mean, opera has a lot of, a lot of beautiful love music. Um, in terms of songs, I don't know. I don't, I don't have anything that just jumps into my mind, but I'm sorry. I don't have more to say about kind of, um, love in in art there's there's a lot of it all right uh don't forget you can use the super chat feature to ask questions um i've got a couple couple of questions here i'm gonna get to um let's see why hasn't philosophy caught up with technology well it's not a matter of catching up i think technology is I, I'm not sure exactly what the, the question refers to, but my, you know, if I had understand the question, whoops, uh, let me just see. 
So I'm not sure what what you mean by why isn't philosophy caught up with technology? I mean, uh, technology keeps progressing, and philosophy seems to be stuck w with Immanuel Kant, uh, you know, uh, 200, 300 years ago. And I think the the reason uh, f for that is is technology is basically still building on the prevalence of a certain perspective which in the culture, which is uh, an enlightenment perspective. So the philosophy of enlightenment, to a large extent, is still in our culture. It remains as part of our world in business, technology, progress. Um, and it's people's admiration for technology and, and, and love of technology, which is still a reflection of whatever's left of their enlightenment philosophy. But technology is very concrete. Technology is very right here. It's, 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 it's a product. It's something that I, that I have that I can see its use. We live in a very anti-intellectual time where people don't see the value of, in, um, in ideas and philosophy at all and therefore uh, don't value innovation, if you will, within philosophy, don't value, uh, I think, as a consequence, Ayn Rand's philosophy, and are quite willing to just accept the concrete, the products, the technology, rather than investigate the philosophy that, that, that it requires. So philosophy is not advanced because people don't understand its value, they don't understand its importance, they don't, and they've just absorbed a particular philosophy from the culture around them, and they're satisfied with that. And if they're not satisfied, because I don't think they really are satisfied, they don't know where to look. They don't know that the answer for their dissatisfaction with their life lies in philosophy. And the intellectuals, and again, it's always the intellectuals' fault, are not guiding them in the right direction. They're not presenting them with an alternative. They're not moving them towards a philosophy that would be consistent with their love of technology, a philosophy that would be consistent with their love of their life or their, or their, their wanting to be successful in life. So they are, um, people sadly are, are, are stuck without guidance. And it's exactly the guidance of philosophers, it's exactly the guidance of intellectuals uh, that they lack, that they need, and, and that they're not getting. And, and that, that is the tragedy. That is a tragedy. Okay, does objectivism have a foothold in the ex-Soviet countries or non-Israel Middle Eastern countries? Well, it depends what you mean by a foothold. There certainly are people, a lot of people reading Ayn Rand in the former Soviets, in the ex-Soviet countries. I remember once being in um, Ukraine a few years ago, and Atlas Shrugged was the best-selling book in Ukraine that year. You could find Atlas Shrugged in like the in like the supermarkets they were selling it. It was it was such a hot seller that even the supermarkets were carrying Atlas Shrugged. So uh, it, it definitely has a foothold there. There are clubs that people are interested in, that people are passionate about it. They, they, you know, I, I saw a production of Night of January the 16th, Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand's play in Ukraine, in Kiev, put on by, by uh, locals there. Um, again, the books sell very well in those countries. There is a lot of passion. What is lacking is a lot of knowledge of objectivism in beyond the novels, in the language of the place. And therefore, there are not a lot of intellectuals who are articulating objectivist ideas in Ukrainian, uh, which is similar to Russian, but not exactly, um, or in, uh, I don't know, Poland, or in, even though. A lot of polls have read Ayn Rand and, and a lot of polls have been influenced by Ayn Rand. There's no intellectual movement yet of people actually advocating for objectivism. But per capita, I think there are a lot of people in Eastern Europe who are fans. Georgia, uh, in, in, the, in the former Yugoslavian states, in uh, Poland, in, in Ukraine, in, in a lot of these Eastern European countries, there is a lot of passion for Ayn Rand and a lot of interest in Ayn Rand. Less so in the Middle East, and I think the reason is that the Middle East is so backward and the struggle, the struggle for survival is so difficult. But even in the Middle East, there is an Ayn Rand club. I don't think they call themselves an Ayn Rand club, but there's basically an Ayn Rand group in Dubai, uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, there are people who listen to this podcast in Saudi Arabia and in uh, many other Arab countries. There is a small group of objectivists in Tunisia. 
um, that I get messages from on a regular basis, kind of regular basis, uh, kind of talking about uh, Ayn Rand and encouraging me to. Well, they're not yet encouraging me to visit Tunisia because they don't think it'd be safe. But they, they, there's definitely a presence, foothold, probably more so in Eastern Europe than there is in in the Middle East. But but there is a presence. There's no question. There's a presence even in the Middle East. Yuan, what is your view? What in your view is the best Latin American country to do business in, excluding Puerto Rico? Well, Puerto Rico is an American country. I mean, I, I it's hard to tell. Um, probably Chile. Um, Chile, but I think Colombia is coming a long way, and and of course Brazil is a great place to do business just because of the the the. It's just a, it's a big country, and and there has been in recent years to try to move towards more rule of law. But I'd say Chile is probably the most advanced in terms of rule of law and, and uh, protection of business. Um, but Chile's heading in the wrong direction. Uh, Chile's heading in the wrong direction. Okay, in theory, Christianity condemns hatred and extols love. In practice, it seems to produce a lot of hatred and little love. Yes, because Christianity wants unconditional love. That's impossible. How can you... How can you it, it, it places love above your values. But love is, is directly interconnected to your values. Love is a, is, a, is, a, is a product of your values and is a value. Um, so I think that it's... Um, just copying some... Uh, so I think Christianity, I mean, Christianity is really bad. Um, and and uh, part of what makes it so bad is that Christianity presents love as detached from pleasure, as detached from value, as you, you should love your neighbor like yourself. Really? I don't love my neighbor like myself, and I shouldn't love my neighbor like myself. I should love myself more than anybody else. And and find people I can love like myself because they are value to me, uh, an immense value to me. That's what romantic love is, is finding somebody who reflects you in them and, and they become a value to you because your life, it's hard to imagine living your life without them. So Christianity undermines love. It undermines pleasure. It undermines uh, self-esteem. It undermines happiness. Um. And, and that's right, it, it produces little love because at the end of the day, love is this impossibility. Love is discounted. Like virtue in Christianity. Virtue is an impossibility. So virtue is discounted. Virtue becomes less important. Whereas in objectivism, virtue is possible. Moral perfection is possible. And therefore, and, and the reasons to be virtuous are your own happiness. You want success, you want flourishing, you want success at living. So virtue is accessible. Love is accessible. Virtue is required. Love is required. Uh, so Christianity, uh, you know, I don't condemn hatred. I don't think objectivism condemns hatred. Hatred is earned. Love is earned. Now, you want to live in a world in which you love more than you hate, because you want to live in a world that a pursuit of positive values. But we don't condemn hatred. Objectivism doesn't. It recognizes that hatred is necessary sometimes. And it extols love, but it extols the proper form of love, a love that is value-driven, not value-less. So Christianity is the source of so many of our culture's problems. It's a source of our, of our views about sex, our views about pleasure, our views about egoism, our views about, about, um, uh, about values, right? our views about work, our views about success. And Christianity, in that sense, Christianity is what needs to be eliminated, eviscerated, the ideas of Christianity needs to be eliminated from individual human life, and it's hard because Christianity is in every aspect of our of our of our culture. It's all around us. 
Do you think men are more likely to be promiscuous than women? If so, do you think it is because of hormones or just because it is more acceptable socially? So I think, yes, men seem to be, just empirically, more promiscuous than women. I think it's probably a combination of some aspect of hormones, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And, but it's it's definitely a, an issue of, of, of culture and society. Uh, and part of that lack of promiscuity among women imposed by culture and society is rational, and part of it is not, right? So let's do that first, and then we'll do hormones. Um, <clears throat> Before birth control, for women to have sex was very dangerous, very costly, you know, very scary. Pregnancy, particularly uh, in, in pre-modern times, um, w w was indeed dangerous. Um, pregnancy in non-modern times was physically dangerous. Many, many women died at childbirth. Uh, and but it was it was incredibly costly. Women didn't typically work in a profession that, where they could support a child um, because of the impact of Christianity. Uh, uh, having children out of wedlock was considered you know this horrible sin. Uh, the costs borne by pregnancy and having a baby out of wedlocks were immense, and therefore. For women to be promiscuous and therefore have uh, get pregnant and, and not know who the father was, let's say, um, was very, very, very dangerous. Existentially, not just culturally, but existentially. And and it wasn't clear how you would support the child, even if you didn't, you know, most women don't die childbirth, but how would you support the child? How would you support yourself? And particularly if men shunned you and didn't want to marry you, because so because you, you know you, you had had a child or you were sexually active so that the prohibition on for women for uh, not ha to not have sex before marriage made some sense in the sense of at least with marriage you had a source of support for the child you had a way to raise the child uh, now in modern times where women can work and women even before birth control some of that goes away and indeed some of it has gone away and women have become uh, much more you know promiscuous is, is not the wrong word but much more uh, uh, open sexually because they can afford to have a child and of course once you have abortions legal and once you have birth control then there is no limitation birth control prevents you from being pregnant and therefore prevents you from suffering the consequences of having a child out of wedlock uh, or having a child you don't want necessarily and um you know abortion makes the 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 bad decision you might have made or the bad outcome that might have happened uh reversible fixable and i think that's one of the reasons why i think abortion is is uh, we, sh we should support abortion. We should support the legality of abortion and the morality of abortion. Uh, so uh, I think from an acceptable society, I think that's all changed. I think that's what the sexual revolution was about. I think birth control had an immense impact culturally. Uh, so that is uh, in terms of culture. Uh, there was a question also about uh, in terms of hormones. And, you know, hormones, I think, for women, because of culture, the, the inclination towards sex is be suppressed. But I do think that uh, the hormones are probably um, more intense among men. And if you put aside uh, towards having sex for the sake of having sex, uh, and you put aside against reason and values and being able to control yourself and being a rational enemy, animal, not just an animal, once you take all that into consideration, then I don't think there are that many uh, differences, right? 
between uh, men and women in terms of uh, in terms of their desire for sex, uh, the intensity of that desire. Um, uh, you know, it, it just it just doesn't strike strike me as uh, as when you take the cultural Im- impacts out that there is that much difference um, that much difference in this dimension. Um, sex is easier for men uh, physically and uh, in, in, in many regards. So it's, it's in, and I think in some respects emotionally, but I think women are just as sexual and have just as strong sexual desires as men do. How about doing more in the culture? like becoming a moral beacon against cancel culture, like more loudly standing up for those unfairly maligned. Um, yeah, that's great. You know, you know, but why is everybody suggesting what I should do? Go do it. Right. Go do it. I'm doing what I want to do. <laughs> um, and I'm not interested in just in, 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 in spending my time seeking out those that are maligned by cancel culture. And I think it's much more complicated um, than one thinks because a lot of people being canceled are people that I don't want to defend. I might not think they should be canceled, but I don't want to have to deal with them as a positive value as somebody I defend. But somebody else could take that up, somebody else who doesn't mind that. I mean, there's a lot of things one can become in the culture. There's a lot of things one can do in the culture to promote better ideas, you know, go do it. Um, as I said, I'm doing what I love doing and what I want to be doing. Is the time right for good commercial promoting objectivism like the lemonade stand on Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism in two minutes? Um, something just as powerful but set to the backdrop of current events. Um, I don't know, maybe, I mean, you'd have to be really clever about it. You'd have to be, you'd have to create something really intense, really powerful, really that caught people's attention. And at the same time of high quality and, and that really reflected some idea. You couldn't just do one commercial. You'd have to do a whole series of them. I, I mean, I suspect it's way too early. I suspect the culture's not ready. I, I, I don't think the problem today is, lack of exposure. Um, I mean, millions of people have read Ayn Rand, but they don't buy it. They don't, they don't accept it. So I think we need to keep getting millions and millions of people exposed to Ayn Rand. I think we need to do that. And if the best way to do that is through commercials, but the, the goal of that kind of commercial should be go read Atlas Shrugged or go read The Fountainhead. And then I think we need to be investing in changing the culture. And that means, again, that means all the different things that are involved in changing a culture, whether it's getting great art produced that, that is reflective of this, but it may be doing some commercials, uh, you know, speaking, writing, uh, engaging in all the different issues, defending people who get canceled by cancel culture, doing all the different things. That's going to require hundreds of different intellectuals doing different things in different regards, not just intellectuals, but artists and scientists and teachers and uh, educators, all kinds of people working out there, working in the culture and, and shifting it and just shifting people's attitudes and, and, and reorienting the culture towards pro-life, pro-value, pro-love, pro-egoism attitudes. And, and of course, fundamentally pro-reason attitudes. And that's just a lot of work, hard work, and it requires a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. I don't think there's one thing that will lead to success. So why don't you do X? Why don't you do Y? You do it. I mean, we need hundreds of people doing this stuff. So, or find somebody else to do it. So, so, so we don't just need your aunt doing stuff. We need lots of people doing stuff. That's how you change a culture. All right. You know, the technical problems here have been, uh, uh, been uh, pretty uh, unfortunate. Um, so I apologize for that, but there's very little I can control with regard to the Wi-Fi here. It just drops, the Wi-Fi just drops every 20 minutes or so, it seems like, or maybe every 30 minutes. All right, let me, uh, let me end here, unless there's some additional Super Chat questions. 
Uh, let me just encourage, again, wish you all a happy Valentine's. I hope you get to celebrate it with somebody uh, you love. Um, somebody says, no reason to kill off Christianity, live and let live. No, there's a crucial reason to kill off Christianity. I'm, I'm for killing off Christianity, not killing Christians, but killing off Christianity. Because, because we're not going to establish freedom. We're not going to establish a culture of, of value orientation. We're not going to establish a culture of love. We're not going to establish a culture with great art and great everything as long as Christianity is thriving and alive. Now, if it's marginalized, fine. But it has to be killed as a dominant cultural force. It has to be And yeah, live and let live, but they don't let you live. Their whole philosophy is not to let you live. Right? So, first practice super chat question. We'll ask more. Oh, great. Thanks, Prog Tiki. Uh, feel free to do so. Uh, so, yes, it, unless there's a quick super chat question, um, I'll say again, happy Valentine's Day. Don't forget what love is about. Love is about your values. Don't forget to pursue those values with passion. Don't forget to identify those values and be clear about what they are. Articulate them in your own mind. Know what you're fighting for. Focus your values on achieving happiness and fulfillment. And live it. Live your life as if, live your life <laughs> loving every moment of it. And if you don't, figure out why and improve. Now, again, I'm not saying there won't be hardships, there won't be problems. But even the hardships and problems in the context of I love my life are going to be very different, are going to be dealt with very differently than from the context, from a different context. So have a great Valentine's Day celebrate your romantic love, celebrate the love you have for your own life, the love you have for reality. And I will see you all probably next Saturday. So we're probably taking a long break here because I'll be traveling and, and uh, I've got a wedding anniversary that I can't do a show on and I'll be doing other stuff. Um, I'm, oh, I'm doing my debate. So those of you in Florida, don't forget, we've got a debate uh, with... Um, uh, the CEO of uh, Whole Foods, uh, John Mackey. And that'll happen at the Villages in Orlando on Thursday night, the 18th. Thursday night, the 18th. So I'll be flying to Florida on the 18th. Uh, if you live anywhere close to that, I hope you'll join us. It should be it should be a lot of fun. And um, and yeah, so so please come. It's uh, and and do it. It's at the Villages in Orlando. Florida, and uh, you can find it online. Just do your own book, Debate Villages, Orlando, John Mackey, and it'll pop right up. All right, everyone, uh, have a great rest of your week. Have a great Valentine's Day, and I will see you all soon.